Hi, everyone. Welcome to Advanced Plan Explorer Usage for Tuning Execution Plans. Um, I'm Devin Leanne Wilson. I will be your moderator today. We are here with Andy Yoon presenting. Um, he is my lovely coworker and coworker twinsy. So we're both excited to be here representing Century One. Um, if you have any questions in the chat, I'll be moderating that for us. So uh, you also may hear me chiming in from time to time as uh, your local Plan Explorer girl from Century One as well. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy Yoon to get us started. Thank you, Devin, for that awesome intro. All right, so let's get underway. <clears throat> So I'm sure you guys have seen this slide plenty of times before. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but you know what? Pass has a lot to offer. Do take some time to check it out. It's really, really good stuff. Session evaluation. I am going to actually spend a little bit more time on this and please ask for some feedback. You know, all of us speakers spend a lot of time putting these presentations together for you. So please give us 30 seconds of your time to give us some feedback. Tell us how to constructively improve because we all want to improve as speakers. So please, please take some time to give us uh, some evaluation feedback. So a little bit of information about me. I'm a solutions engineer with uh, Century One <coughs> Solar Winds because yes, Solar Winds has acquired Century One. Uh, but rest assured, SQL Century and Plan Explorer are not going anywhere, so don't worry about that. In either case, I'm a former DBA and developer. Blah 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 blah. Uh, but you know, I am fairly active up on Twitter, so feel free to hit me up there, heckle me online uh, if you want. Uh, we can have a little bit of fun here. It's all good. So we're all friends here, right? In either case, that's enough of that. Okay. Before we begin, I do want to address the elephant in the room. Plan Explorers, which is what this presentation is all about, is made by Century One. Devin and I work for Century One. However, this is not a vendor session. This is uh, in, uh, built up as a community session, actually. So uh, because I've been a community speaker for many years, and this is what I really wanted to do with this session. I just wanted to teach a bunch of people. Yes, I happen to be an employee of Century One at the same time, um, but I'd like to think that affords me even more insider information and insight than what might be available to you from someone else. But rest assured, uh, my promise to you is that there's not going to be any sales, marketing, nothing. In fact, I'm not even here to try and convince you to use Plan Explorer. My ideal audience members are folks who already use Plan Explorer today. Hence, this is why this is an advanced session. In either case, let me be very clear about today's goal and agenda. So I want to uh, try and convey some of the things that will help you get even more out of Plan Explorer. Because the thing about Plan Explorer is that it offers you a great amount of breadth and depth um, as far as getting into your execution plans. So it's all about speed to figuring out what's going on, helping you drill in faster to those nitty gritty details as far as uh, what's going sideways in uh, your various execution plans. This presentation is going to be almost completely demo. I do have a, a few slides up front, and you'll kind of understand why I had to do those in slides as opposed to live demo as well. And I want to emphasize that this is an advanced session. I am not going to be covering basics about Plan Explorer. Um, however, if you did happen to wander in here and you're not familiar with Plan Explorer, there's a phenomenal resources slide here with tons and tons and tons of documentation. Um, <clears throat> now to get at this resource slide, in addition to other resources that I'll detail or recap at the end, go to my GitHub, github.com slash SQL back. That's the most important thing that uh, you want to remember and it is in the uh, bottom of my slides as well. And of course, this will pop up once again at the end. Okay. So first of all, what I want to do is kind of set, you know, uh, um, you know, set the stage, if you will. Let's 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 put us into the right mindset of when we should be using Plan Explorer versus when we should be using Management Studio. Because most of us, myself included, for many years, would spend probably 90% of our time in Management Studio when doing stuff, and only crack open Plan Explorer on an as-needed basis to take a quick glance um, at an execution plan. So to that end, I really like this queer or this quote. I think there are two steps in the evolution of a query: ensuring correct results and performance optimization. This quote is by my good friend Aaron Bertrand, who used to be the product manager uh, for Plan Explorer during his tenure at Century One. But you know, ensuring correct results is really the purview or the realm of Management Studio. That's where we're going to be messing around, making sure the query's you know returning exactly what we want it to. Once it's doing that, I want to encourage you to start using Plan Explorer to help 
uh, ensure that it's you know returning the correct results in a timely fashion, in an efficient fashion. I want to help you reduce the bouncing back and forth because a lot of folks don't realize that you can use Plan Explorer as a development environment, or as I like to think of it, instead of an IDE, a uh, performance tuning environment. And that's what I'm hoping uh, uh, you guys will kind of get out of uh, this presentation today is to start using Plan Explorer as that uh, performance environment. <clears throat> So first of all, what I'd like to cover is uh, customization of the user interface, okay? So a lot of us these days, especially since we're all at home, are stuck just using laptops and whatnot. And the thing about Plan Explorer is that it's a very dense uh, tool. There's a lot of information here that we present to you. And for example, you see the plan diagram in the middle and index analysis at the bottom, but a lot of stuff in index analysis is hidden right now. So if I want to see more of that, I got to move my windows around and at the sacrifice of squishing the plan diagram so I can see less of the plan diagram now. And that's a bit of a headache. I'll fully admit that. Now, of course, after a while of being stuck at home, uh, I went on and bought a second monitor and a lot of us uh, went back to the office, got, got more hardware, so on and so forth, right? So here's the thing. Did you ever consider leveraging that second monitor for uh, Plan Explorer? Because did you know that you can drag independent or individual windows out of the original window? So what I'm highlighting here is like, this is the original window. Pretend that this is on one monitor, but on the other hand, now I have additional tabs over here that I've dragged out, pulled it out of the base window and thrown them onto my second monitor. So imagine this being a, a two monitor view, or if you have one of those really crazy single monitor, like widescreen monitors, you can do something like this as well. You can even mix and match a management studio in amongst this as, if you wanted to as well. Point more being is that leverage that screen real estate that you happen to have. You're not trapped at just one single monitor and just the main window. All right, so with that, let's dive into demo for the rest of this particular uh, presentation. So what I have up in front of you right now is Plan Explorer, and this is the default layout. And what I want to uh, kind of show you guys is how you can kind of customize uh, uh, the different areas. If I were to click and grab the top of a given window, then it'll drag everything. And notice down here, you know, we got multiple tabs of stuff, right? But if I grab an individual tab, then it'll only pull that tab on out. Okay, so I'm going to grab top operations as an example, and then we'll zoom in here. So I'm going to bring top operations here into the middle, and notice I have a number of different choices. I can stack it on the uh, right or left side, tile it up in, or on the bottom, or I could stick it right here in the middle, which would make it a tab element. Uh, if I'm scrolling over here, I'm trying not to scroll too fast to, you know, make it super uh, crazy, uh, give people motion sickness here or nothing like that. Um, but in either case, yeah, uh, I can either make it a tabbed element as well. So I'm going to uh, put this, stack this over here on the right, and then I'm going to grab another random tab from down here. And now I'm going to make this a tab over here on this right um, uh, window over here. And then maybe I'm going to grab the plan XML, for example, and now I'm going to stack it fully over here on the right as well. So <clears throat> it can be a, a full vertical element as well. Uh, so again, hopefully you get a good sense of how I can kind of mess around and play with some of these. Heck, if I wanted to, you know, this is where I'm just going to grab index analysis and now I'm going to have this as a floating window uh, doing its own thing over here. And then, you know what, I'm going to, uh, you know, stick the plan tree onto that. And, you know, I can do all sorts of crazy things as you can kind of see here. I'm kind of messing around with this. Now, if you decide to get really, really crazy and then you're like, you know what, I'm not too happy with this, how can I just go back to the defaults? Well, unfortunately, there's not really a good way to do this in the user interface. Uh, frankly, the best way I found to do it is just to close everything down. And then you'll go to a particular URL. Um, it's in your uh, users uh, folder. Um, App data, local, Century One, Plan Explorer. Don't worry, there's a hint for this on the slide deck a little bit later on a reference slide, so you don't have to memorize this right now. But uh, understand that in this folder, there's a layouts folder and a couple of XML files. I actually don't know which of these controls what, so I just kind of take the brute force approach of grabbing them all and deleting them. But once I do do that, then I can uh, just go back to my files. Uh, let's see, here it is open up my PE session once again. And now when I open up Plan Explorer again, we will be back to the default layout. 
So that being said, I will say that I'm also not a fan of the default layout. I like to kind of move things around. The main thing that I like to change up is that I like to take the plane diagram and I move it to the middle area and uh, uh, create this as a tab right here. Um, sometimes I will also move plan XML and stack this over on the right hand side. And that way I can pin it in and out. Um, so that's only, you know, I do that sometimes or other, but you see how that's now a pinned tab here. Hey, Devin, are there any um, you know, customizations or layout preferences that you happen to have? Let me uh, put you on the spot. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe not so much a layout preference, just something that I tend to do every time I look at a plan. You know, especially if you're using um, a monitoring solution, whenever you come over to Plan Explorer, usually you saw something, a reason why you wanted to look at this particular plan. Um, sometimes it's, wow, that's a lot of I.O. going on. Can I reduce that? Other times it's, um, wow, I've got a ton of CPU uh, cycles coming from this particular statement. So if I'm looking at my plan explorer diagram um, or my plan diagram, I always like to right click on that plan diagram and start looking at costs by CPU or IO individually. So I can see if I have any, um, any operators that I should be focusing on if I'm trying to tune towards one resource or another. And the other thing that I just do because I'm sort of obsessed with indexes and I love the index analysis tab is keep that right next to my plan diagram at all times. So I know um, how effective are the indexes I already have for this plan and how does that shake out as far as, you know, statistics being up to date on, on those indexes and on those columns that we're working with. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, you guys not only have a moderator today, but you also, uh, I now have a co-presenter, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the next thing I want to talk about, I still want to kind of stick with the theme of uh, customization right now. And let's talk a little bit about the statements area up here at the top. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what, and let me zoom in here. So what a lot of folks will do is that they'll only really reference things like you know duration, CPU, reads and writes and stuff like that. But what I find is that a lot of folks don't often take the time or the trouble to scroll over to the right. And they really should because these different columns will show up dynamically depending on what is inside uh, your different execution plans. But there can be very, very insightful things like key lookups or you know the max degrees of parallelism, which can show me queries that, hey, went parallel, right? Or how many table scans that I happen to have? Or do I have any missing index recommendations? Like for example, this query has a missing index recommendation, this one here and a couple of these guys here, right? So, uh, or this one, which is actually particularly useful is missing join predicates. We never wanna be joining a table without a, uh, without a predicate, right? But apparently I happen to have at least one in here. So again, it's one of those interesting gotchas. Uh, so I encourage you to check out those different columns uh, whenever. Now, in addition to that, let me open up the column chooser and then I'll zoom in on it so that way you can kind of see it all. <clears throat> so whenever I right click on a given column, I, I'm presented with this particular context menu and one of the items in here is the column chooser. Um, and as you can see here, there's a whole bunch of other different data points that we can present to you if you really want to see them. Now, granted, unless your first name happens to be Paul or Hugo, <laughs> chances are you're not going to be checking out most of these things. But, you know, some of us may want to know about the uh, cardinality estimator model that's being used, especially if we are on a server that's in a mixed environment uh, or such that, you know, I ported over a whole bunch of uh, databases from 08R2 and, you know, I left them in the old compatibility mode. So, you know, sometimes it's important to know what CE model you are using uh, when you're troubleshooting some, you know, particularly nasty uh, code. Or sometimes I want to know about spool operations, for example, uh, because that's, uh, you know, indicative of unexpected use of tempdb, you know, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so these are additional extra columns that you can drag in and drop uh, to kind of, again, give you that extra level of, uh, of detail and information. Now, one other area I also want to kind of mention is that down here at the bottom, we have two uh, other tabs, one called plan tree, another called top operations. There are different ways of uh, presenting data and such. Let me pick uh, something that has a little bit more activity or uh, interesting output. I think this guy does. No. All right, in either case. So with this one, if I right click here and go to the column chooser, there's gonna be a wide variety of other different data points that are now available to me because we're looking at things from an operation perspective. 
So again, let me zoom in on this. So again, unless you know you really, really, really want to deep dive into the nuances and the nitty gritty details of your execution plans, you're probably not going to be making use of most of these. Uh, but if you're the type of person who in Management Studio spends a lot of time in the properties tab of, of a given operation to dig in those uh, nitty gritty details, well, those nitty gritty details are available to you here. Now, one quirk that I will point out is that uh, the plan tree and top operations have a very similar, uh, you know, layout. You know, they're both talking about the operators. The plan tree is giving everything in a tree style format, but the columns that are available to you slightly differ. So I do want to point out that little bit of nuance. So. Uh, the last thing about the UI that I want to point out is uh, the filtering capability and the sorting capability because it's often overlooked and uh, it's often overlooked because you only ever see the little filter icon if you happen to be mousing over a given column header. So uh, you see this teeny tiny little thing that pops up here. So if I click on this guy here. <clears throat> What's kind of cool is that, first of all, you see a distinct list of all of the possible values in the entire results set. So I, the one I selected was missing join predicates, um, and I either have zero, or I actually have a query in here that has seven missing join predicates. That's pretty awful. So uh, maybe I want to click on that guy and uh, uh, dig into that. Otherwise, I can always click on the custom button up here. Um, and that way, then that'll bring up a different uh, little wizard. And that way, I can set up my own thing, like greater than three, uh, greater than one, or between one and five, or whatever. You know, and I can set those different types of uh, you know, custom predicates if I wanted to. And also you can you know, click on the different column headers and uh, sort, like for example, uh, I'm gonna sort by actual reads. So if I sorted by actual reads, then uh, you know, for example, you know, I can mess around with the different sorting and that sort of thing. But I'm also zooming in here to also point out a different nuance that not a lot of people expect. A lot of folks, when they're using Plan Explorer, they do it such that, or the workflow is such that they're, they run the query in, um, Management Studio, and then they right click and open in uh, Plan Explorer. And they get an interface that doesn't quite look like this. Do you see how, for example, you know, this workload store procedure is actually calling other store procedures? You might stop yourself if you think, wait, I've never seen this behavior before. That's because of an interesting nuance when it comes to the command text pane over here. So let me actually go back in history and this is what most people are typically expecting to see. It's a flat, uh, a flat result set because all we're doing when we pull everything out of Management Studio is we're just getting all of the different plan XML basically. So I don't see who called what. I don't see the full call stack as we like to call it. And then when I click on command text in a moment, you're gonna see that it's blank which it is because we don't have any code in here. That does not come with you when you, uh, you know, port over from uh, Management Studio. However, if I were to copy and paste that code in here, as I did right here, and then I execute it using get actual plan, <clears throat> sorry, Hugo. Um, and if I were to execute it using this, then I will get a whole, you know, I will get the full call stack in addition to wait stat information as well from uh, the query execution. So. This is the first step to shifting your mindset to using Plan Explorer as a performance tuning environment. Copy that code over, run it within Plan Explorer. That way you get a whole wealth of other information. So for example, as you can see right here, I actually have while loops in this code. Those while loops would ne never show up in the traditional format, the other approach, because they don't have execution plans associated with them. But I definitely see them here. And if for whatever reason these statements uh, you know, had some kind of duration associated with them, maybe a wait for delay or something like that that you put in there for testing and you forgot to take out for production, those types of things would show up in here as well. So that's you know, stuff like that can be very useful. So keep that in mind, keep that nuance in mind of, you know, copying that code back over into the command text and using get actual plan to rerun things. One last tip and trick I do want to share with you before we kind of move on into uh, some other stuff is uh, the right click and the reset sorting. You know, this example right now, this PE session has a whole bunch of different code and, you know, other code and whatnot. So if I'm playing around with the sorting and whatnot, maybe I want to go back to the true execution order, right? So I can just come in here and uh, click on reset sorting. People have asked me, what does clear all sorting do? Franklin, I don't know. 
um, you know, I've been meaning to ask uh, internally for a while, but you know what? I, I, I don't see a need for it because reset sorting does the trick. So I don't know why it's here, but it's here. So in either case. Um, I'm going to pause at this moment and Devin uh, ask if there are any questions that have come into the questions pane. Yes, in fact, uh, there is. So one of them I answered. Um, it, it's actually a great question. So um, a Caesar D asked, is it possible for me to easily select all of the tables um, slash indexes that were used by the optimizer in a textual format so I can, for instance, construct update statistics commands for them. So um, currently there's not. And the reason for that, Andy, if you wanted to pull up the index analysis tab so we can show them rather than just tell them, um, <laughs> the index the e e index analysis right underneath that heading, you'll see selected operations. So uh, your selected operations drop down there is going to show you each node where there's an index scan or an index seek. So this is dealing with one uh, table, one index at a time um, for this whole for this whole uh, view. So once you're on your preferred um, node, then you'll notice a um, in this case bolded index name. So for this, it's the clustered index. That's what the optimizer is currently using just for this node. So if you were to flip to other nodes in that drop down, then you would see other um, bolded indexes that the optimizers, the optimizer is using for those particular, um, there we go, for those particular nodes. So at the bottoms of these, what you'll notice is the last time statistics were updated and then the histogram button is gonna be what you could click on to go ahead and update statistics. But there's currently no magic button to help script all of this out at once for you. This is gonna be um, a, a GUI click by click item. Um, any other tips that you can think of on that question, Andy? That's, all, that's that all I got question. for it. Yeah, not for that okay. question, no, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, getting that type of information in general, even just in uh, traditional SQL Server is actually kind of a challenge. So yeah, unfortunately, there's not a good way to again get that kind of summary type of information, especially if you've got a whole bunch of different statements. It is a great question though, and it would be something mm -hmm. really cool to be able to do. Um, for yeah. sure. Um, there's another question here, and I actually don't know the answer to this because I'm not a big, um, I, I'm a big user of, of the product itself. I don't find myself in SSMS uh, these past couple of years doing a lot of FTT SQL um, and using Plan Explorer standalone, but we do have a user, Mark M, um, that wants to know, um, he said, I would like to know how to address the condition when when I'm analyzing a plan exported from SSMS, um, he gets a message that he's unable to collect execution plans because the command text is empty. And he notes that the command text is not auto-populated for actual plans loaded from Management Studio. Right. So this goes yeah. back to what I was talking about of like the typical workflows that, hey, I ran some code inside Management Studio. And if you even look in the history here, I have that, you know, kind of here to simulate that. So it's on you to actually copy and paste the code in here. Or you can actually just type some other code in here. And this actually leads into a demo that I forgot I was going to do. Like, for example, I'm just going to uh, do a quick select star from Sys databases. Now I'm going to rerun or get actual plan once again. And now you'll see the full result set. And uh, for what it's worth while I'm on this uh, topic, notice that there's a whole bunch of other different statements here. Again, when we do the get actual plan inside Plan Explorer, I get a whole bunch of other runtime information, like the fact that we had to do a whole bunch of stats updates behind the scenes, even though this is just a very simple select star from Sys databases. So yes, uh, you do have to manually populate the command text because again, when we come out of Management Studio, all we are, all we are able to bring with us into Plan Explorer is just a plan XML, not the actual command text. So uh, unfortunately, that's just a limitation of just, uh, again, the integration path. Yeah, and we have another question that just came through that I'll go ahead and just answer here. Um, so Tim C wants to know, is that uh, Tim Cartwright, perhaps from Insperity? Um, just a question, follow-up question. Um, is there a way to get an actual plan with code like a store procedure that has insert, update, delete statements without actually running the code, or do you have to use the estimated? So um, there is no way that I'm aware of to get the actual plan without running the code. Um, you are, 
if, if you can't run the code, you're going to have to use the estimated plan. Because also keep in mind that get actual plan is really kind of a misnomer. Hugo Cornelis has a phenomenal article about this, but it's really all about get the execution plan with runtime stats is really what the actual plan actually is. So if I don't execute it, how am I supposed to get runtime stats? Because I mean, uh, that's what we are collecting. That's that's what makes, the, that's the big difference between an estimated plan and an actual plan. I don't want to get too, I don't want to go down that particular rabbit hole. There are plenty of others out there uh, who do that, uh, but go check out Hugo's article about that. Um, and, you know, he talks a lot about how he wishes that the names for these would be changed. That's actually why I apologized to him earlier, a little bit of an inside joke. <clears throat> Awesome. And, and we have another question come in, and I actually don't know the answer to this one. Um, could we disable the red color on the plan diagram cost? When starting working, I think that it will help me to localize hot operations, but then I'd like to silence coloring because I'm afraid it would distract me. Um, it would ultimately distract him, basically. So you can now right click and show color scale. Ooh. So I just did that, and now you see there are no more colors. Well, nice. See, this is my thing that I learned today. Everybody learned something from advanced plan explorer <laughs> sessions, even people have been around and using it for four years. <laughs> All right, so with that, let's uh, hold off on any additional questions. I will pause a few more times uh, throughout this, but I do want to uh, you know, get back rolling and uh, continue onward. So um, if you read the abstract, you'll know that, you know, I did say that we're going to be going over different uh, kind of um, uh, execution patterns or that sort of thing. So the first one that I kind of want to talk about is parallelism. Um, that's something that many of us combat on a regular basis, runaway parallelism, unexpected parallelism, unbalanced parallelism. So I want to show you how you can utilize Plan Explorer to help identify if one of these particular things is happening. So for that, let me do a quick bit of setup. I'm just going to grab, uh, go into column chooser, and then I'll explain what I've dragged in. So I'm bringing in one extra column here, and then I will zoom in. So up here, there are actually three different columns that can help you decipher, uh, you know, how much parallelism has occurred. I use air quotes around that. Degree of parallelism, of course, which talks about the number of cores a given uh, query used. And then there's parallel operations and parallelism operations. These two being uh, named similarly are somewhat confusing. Parallel operations are the number of operators that went parallel, like a scan, for example, that wound up going parallel, okay? Parallelism operations are the operators that help to control uh, parallelism. For example, like a gathering of the streams parallel, uh, uh, parallelism operation. So to help kind of zero in on this, uh, let's focus in on an example. I'm going to use parallelism operations. I'm going to select three. And then the example that I want uh, should be this guy. I have a cheat sheet over here. And for what it's worth, I actually have a cheat sheet. It's all up on my GitHub of all of the different demos that I'm doing and that sort of thing, and kind of step by step, also to help me kind of remember uh, all the stuff that I happen to do. Um, but in either case, this is something that'll help you along as well as you want to recreate this later because there's also a full PE session file uh, out there as well. Okay. So um, I'm going to come down here. I'm going to sort. So we're inside top operations now. And remember, I grabbed uh, parallelism operations. So there are three of them. And you see that we have prepended uh, the gather streams and the repart repartition streams, hence why there are three here. Now, as far as the things that went parallel, you're going to reference this particular column over here. So it's just a bunch of different checkboxes. And pretty much everything in here uh, kind of went parallel. So that's the one thing to note out of top operations. Now, one question that we often ask ourselves, is this bad parallelism in that, is it unbalanced parallelism? To answer that, this is where I'm going to want to use the plan tree instead. And inside the plan tree, I have thread 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we can now show you the record distribution as they were, you know, basically the workload is passed out amongst all of the different, uh, uh, amongst the different threads. And if you're not really familiar with the nuances of parallelism, I gave a kind of a quick overview in my other past summit presentation, a beginner's guide to performance tuning. So go check that recording out. Uh, I want to say that's like chapter three uh, in that particular session. But, you know, I use a fun analogy to kind of break this down and why this could potentially be bad. But in either case, this is an example of relatively good balanced parallelism. You know, everyone got about an equal amount of work, as opposed to if I have this guy over here, 
Well, okay, this is also an example of a, a pretty good uh, a pretty good distribution here. So, you know, maybe that's one that I'm not going to be as worried about. Sorry, I, the other example is actually under parallelism operations one. Yeah, I use these filters as kind of a cheat sheet to figure out uh, where my different examples reside because there's a lot of code uh, in this uh, particular workload. Okay, so here's the example that I wanted to show you of this particular store procedure and this statement where one thread got a whole heck of a lot more data than all of the others. So what do I do about this? Well, I mean, you know, this might be indicative of a statistics issue. So I might go back to uh, the index analysis tab to find out when stats were last updated or look at the statistics histogram. We'll get to that topic shortly uh, to figure out, okay, uh, you know, based upon the parameters that were used and so on and so forth. But in either case, why did we have unbalanced parallelism here? Because this could have been something that could have caused us a great bit of headache, some excessive CX packet weights, for example, so on and so forth. So that's where you can find this level of information. Now, a different thing that I want to talk about is whether a query should have gone parallel or not in the first place. A lot of us talk about cost threshold for parallelism and that sort of thing. So for that, I need to go back to, uh, oops, I need to go back to top operations. Sorry, not plan tree. And then I need to bring in a different uh, optional column as well. The estimated total subtree cost. So a lot of folks will just hover over the plan diagram itself, and I'll do that right now. And this is where we can get the estimated uh, subtree cost when I uh, get that. It's 35.94 uh, query bucks or units or whatever you want to call it. But we can actually show that value to you here inside top operations. That's It's an optional column right here. Now, you know we don't know which is which because top operations is not inherently sorted in the execution path. So I always like to just resort by the uh, estimated subtree cost percentage because that percentage is basically showing you what percentage amongst the tree as we are going up the tree essentially is what it's all, what the estimated subtree cost percentage is. Uh, so when I resort by that, we get the parallelism gather streams operator, which is the next to last operator uh, in the chain of the um, of the execution plan. So this is how I figure out which one is the is the overall cost. Now, yes, I could also just sort by this guy as well. So I mean, but I I wanted to use this as an excuse to also explain what this column meant anyway. But I can very easily see now that this is a store procedure or a piece of code that, you know, falls underneath that, you know, kind of uh, guideline of uh, cost social for parallelism starting at 50. You know, a lot of people will suggest that you readjust it to 50 as a starting point and then, and then adjust from there. Uh, but if I'm on a SQL server that's still running the default, I might stop and say, well, wait a minute, did I really want this guy to go parallel? Because there's a little bit of extra room to go uh, overhead, I should say, to go parallel and then regather the streams and all that kind of stuff. Again, that's a separate discussion, which I happen to talk about in another presentation. But again, this is indicative of that kind of behavior. And I might say to myself, hey, maybe I want to force this to go serial. Or maybe I actually finally want to get around to updating cost threshold for parallelism, especially if this is a query that's executed a whole heck of a lot. So I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole. I just want to point out to you, this is how you can find that key bit of information, or one of the many ways that you can find that particular bit. Okay, so I will pause at that point for some water and see if there happens to be any questions. Devin? You know, I don't see any um, additional questions in the question tab. Um, the, Andy Levy's out there uh, really helping us out, though. Uh, awesome. Somebody, Thanks, Andy. So, <laughs> somebody did ask, uh, when when did SolarWinds acquire Century One? And Andy already responded with... Um, with a with a link with details over on the solar winds website uh, but this is very recent uh this was um official as of last week um as far as like the close date of the acquisition goes so so this is um this is a recent thing and uh while we can't get into too many details because it's so fresh and new we are excited about it and uh we will be um keeping plan explorer free i know andy said it's not going away but it's also going to continue to be free you do know that and we yep, will be continuing uh business as usual through the end of the year before we start seeing some you know uh integrations with uh the parent company cool so any right. more questions about that i did want to let you guys know while while i've got um a moment on the mic um if you do have something that you want me to respond to if you would kindly put that in the questions um section for some reason i'm not able to respond to you on the discussion board 
All right, awesome. And I'm just refreshing my view here because I have the presentation also up on a tab just to try and keep my eye out on things as well. So in either case, let's continue on. All right, so we talked a bit about parallelism. Now let's talk a little bit about parameter sniffing, another very common challenge that many of us happen to have to deal with. So I do want to reset sorting, but uh, I'll take this opportunity to also share a quick tip with you. If you're ever messing around up here and trying to find you know, certain things and you're like, wait, where did that piece of code go? There was a statement in here, right? Or something like that. Always keep an eye out as to whether you happen to have a filter enabled or not. Because uh, especially if I were to jump back into the command text and rerun another piece of code, where did all my statements go? Nothing showed up here because the filter will still stick around. So this is something that's burned me numerous occasions. Uh, I always kind of forget uh, about this filter. So it's like, oh yeah, I put a filter on it. So click that, we've removed the filters. Okay, let's get back to normal. So to that, I do want to go to the end of my call stack here uh, where we're gonna be talking about a specific set of code. I will uh, rearrange my windows a little bit just so that we can focus exclusively on my example. Okay, so, and then I will zoom in here and then I will explain the underlying code and what's going on here. All right, because we have the full call stack here, you see that I'm creating a variable called my state, and then I'm running a store procedure called get sales summary by state and group by year, where we pass the state value in uh, as our parameter, and then we run some code. And here's the code that we run. Blah, 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 blah. You don't really care about it. Really, the only key detail that we want to focus in on for today is the fact that we are using the state value against the customer table. Okay, so, you know, number of customers uh, in a given state is going to impact this particular query. Um, and as you can look at just some of the initial uh, output here, you know, when we first pass in Alaska, you know, my uh, duration is really, really fast. That's really cool. My IO is relatively low. I'm not too worried about that. But then when I pass in Illinois, my duration increases dramatically, as does my underlying I/O. So, oh no, that you know, you know, we have a problem here. Uh, you know, I wonder if this is parameter sniffing. Now, a lot of times when folks start looking at uh, parameter sniffing type issues, they'll check the estimated versus actual. But when you look at estimated versus actual of this example, this is worthless because estimated and actual happen to be the same value of one. And the reason for that is this. This particular query, I, which I intentionally wrote this way, is an aggregate query. So this little tidbit that you would typically look for is worthless to you. You can't look at the estimated versus actual on a global scale, on the summary scale, or on the final output. But you can look at it on an operator by operator basis. So this is an example where I might jump into uh, top operations. Um, let's see, I will use this one down here to look at the bad one. And then, yeah, we have, you know, actual and estimated rows down here. And we actually uh, uh, have some highlighting where, you know, things don't quite match up, <laughs> right? So, you know, we, you know, uh, SQL Server estimated 76, but, you know, we wound up with a nearly 200,000, right? So, I mean, obviously we have some definite, uh, definite skew here. So, you know, one of the many places where you can see that level of detail. The next thing I do want to point out to you is that we do have the parameters tab. And you know, note that I'm looking at the second select statement that we ran with Illinois. And we can then show you the compiled value versus the runtime value. I see I have a problem here. Before I dive into how to deal with that problem and get more details, the other cool tip I want to share with you is uh, on the plan diagram itself. So you know, we're looking at the actual execution plan, right? But there's this cool button up here at the top called show estimated plan. Now, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I'm using tools, even like Management Studio, something I've been using for God knows how long now, there's a whole bunch of buttons that I've just never bothered clicking on or ever trying. I, I just like, I don't know, I, I've never bothered with that. And I'm ashamed to poke fun of myself, not really ashamed, but you know, I'm poking fun of myself because I never bothered checking this button out until relatively recently when I was actually developing this presentation earlier this year. And this thing is really, really, really cool because it gets around the whole you know, estimated versus actual one is equal to one on the summary level and it gives you that quick visual indicator of hey something is wrong here because you can whenever i flip back and forth we're looking at the action right but now when i flip back and forth i can very easily see how line thickness and, and some other elements change let me zoom in here and do this uh, once more hey wait a minute my actual versus my estimated is way off so even just by doing that i can just get that quick sense of you know 
did I happen to have, you know, uh, cardinality estimation issues somewhere along my plant tree, right? So this has now become one of my go-to things of like, you know, I, I always just do that quick little flip back and forth, back and forth to see if there's anything that kind of jumps out at me, right? So again, one of those cool little tips and tricks. All right, so with that, um, let's take a look at the data distribution of customers per state. And typically what a lot of folks will do is they'll jump back to Management Studio and write a, a, a quick little count query against the uh, customers table. But you don't have to do that because we got the actual plan here in Management Studio, which means I have statistics information if I drop into uh, index analysis. So let me switch to the customer table reference and then I need to select the uh, state. And then I'm going to increase the statistics histogram. I will pop up the tooltip and then I will zoom in. Okay, let me explain what's going on here. So we have the stats histogram. And for those of you who are not in the United States that are watching this, the United States only happens to have 50 discrete states, which makes this uh, for a relatively convenient example. Uh, the orange bars uh, basically show me how many values are in the histogram, not the table but I can very clearly see that Alaska doesn't even register on the scale, whereas Illinois has a whole heck of a lot. Massachusetts has a fair amount as well. And you know, if I scroll further to the right, you know, I have a couple of other states that have a, you know, a more than a the average amount of information. So you know, it's a cool little visual indicator. The blue indicates what we actually, you know, like what range of the histogram we wound up hitting. In this case, Illinois, the range high key was, you know, uh, uh, was that. The estimated number of rows, not for this, but that was originally called for in the execution plan when this was first compiled with Alaska is 76. And then we have the actual rows of 189,000. So it, again, I don't need to go back to the base table. I don't need to jump back to management studio if I took the effort and time of you know, copying, pasting and running the code here. Now I have all of this underlying information. One caveat that I really wanna point out to you though, is that we only get the statistics information when you get the actual plan. So if you're looking at something that happened or trying to do a, a post-mortem on something that happened like a week ago, your stats may have changed since then. So we unfortunately cannot go back in time. So I do want to kind of point out that one key caveat. So in this particular case, you see that the optimizer has given us a missing index recommendation. But one of the other things, I'm actually going to disable this. One of the other things that um, I often overlooked was the visible columns options here. Um, we have indexed, used, and query, but the other column is usually unchecked. And I just did that real fast to kind of show you what things look like. So in this case, the only columns that will appear in uh, here is customer ID and state, but we will not show all of the other columns in that particular table. This could be useful, but this could also not help you as well. I actually prefer to see the other columns as well, because if I'm, especially if I'm looking at a missing index recommendation, let me kind of keep all of this together. You know, okay, the missing index recommendation is saying, yeah, I should create an index on state, but you know what? Maybe I know my workload well enough where I should add in a couple of other columns as uh, included columns as well. So maybe I'll go ahead and do that to help cover uh, more of my workload or something like that, right? Um, I have a comment about this one as well. Yeah. So if, if you guys are seeing missing index one like this, that means that the missing index recommendation came from Plan Explorer. When you see the traditional missing index, um, I, I the word is escaping me. I haven't had enough coffee. Nomenclature from the DMVs that you would usually see in SSMS, that one's coming from your your SQL Server recommendations and not not Plan Explorer. So it is nice to know sometimes where those missing recommendations are coming from. I did not know that one. That's actually a new one on me. Really? Yeah. Wow. Really. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. I seriously had no idea about that one. That's actually really awesome because I know we had Paul White uh, in the office uh, uh, a, num a couple of years back and I know that he uh, worked with our engineering team for a good week because I know that he helped uh, define the total score value and the algorithm behind that. Um, mm -hmm. But that's actually a, a cool bit. I had no yeah. idea. That's yeah, really awesome. It, it, the way the algorithm works too, um, if for those that don't know, it, it's not an exact science. So it, it, just a little bit of insight into how that algorithm works. Um, basically, if there's a sort order or a predicate on any of these columns, um, that's where you're going to get a bright green. This is a good choice uh, as like the first or, or one of your top choices um, in your key column order. Um, 
you may know your own data well enough to make better choices than our rules of thumb will. Um, so know your data, but, but it gets you part of the way there. Um, and then anywhere where there's not a predicate or a sort order, uh, Plan Explorer is going to give you a high score for including those columns um, or putting them in the key column. It kind of scores them the same. So just keep an eye out on those. Um, it's a good helper. Again, not an exact. Uh-oh, Devin, uh, I think your audio is cutting out nuts. And this is where I was going to make a joke about how it'd be like totally high-fiving you up on stage right now, but uh, it looks like instead you're kind of fizzing out on us. So uh, uh, that's a bit of a bummer. Anyway, um, all right. So on with the show then, I suppose. Uh, yeah, okay. It doesn't look like she's coming back to us. Yeah, well, hopefully she doesn't drop off entirely. Well, in either case, the show will go on. So in addition to all of that, so uh, I do want to kind of show you how we can, you know, execute that missing index recommendation. But of course, this is a parameter sniffing issue. Um, a lot of us already know that, you know, creating this missing index is not going to help things, right? So if I were to execute this guy right here, because I'm going to live dangerously and actually do this in prod, um, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to copy and paste out the different cell values uh, and dump those into the command text. Whoops, I should have just done that as a cell, not a row. One, two. And then uh, come back here, just grab the uh, store procedure. So copy cell. There we go. And then uh, I will drop back to uh, redo this as Illinois set, uh, blah, blah, blah is equal to Illinois. And then I'm going to rerun this. So remember, we made that index change. Is that missing index uh, recommendation going to magically fix my query? Again, we already know the answer to this. No, of course not. Um, but I'm I'm more doing this to just to kind of show you how you can you know continue following those steps as well of troubleshooting, of iterating through. Because now I at least see um, that we have some improvements uh, when I look at the. Um, uh, you know, how we reference the customer table. Where is it? Here. So customer missing index one, we did hit the missing index and we do have some improvement. How else can I measure the improvement? Well, I can look at the table IO, for example, we gather the, uh, the equivalent of set statistics IO information and, uh, you know, the, uh, the customer information or the customer table here, 288 logical reads. But Andy, what was the uh, other one before? Well, we have the history pane to the rescue. I can jump back in history, look at that original guy right here, and see that the, uh, what is it, uh, customer table right here, we did 15,000 logical reads instead. So, um, you know, hey, uh, make use of that history to, again, jump back in time to kind of help you do the back and forth. Hey, Devin, welcome back. <laughs> so, yay for, uh, um, um, you know, random technical issues. In either case, uh, so that's a bit of an example around uh, index analysis, but I want to shift gears and still remain talking about index analysis, but talk a little bit about something else, something called the tipping point. And this relates to one of my other favorite topics, key lookup operations. So I'm going to select a particular example where key lookup operations is equal to one. And then uh, let's see, I want the sales summary transaction date. Uh, by sales year. I think it's, is it this one or is it the other one? Um, the one with this one. Okay. So if you're not familiar with what the tipping point is, uh, in SQL Server, when you have a non-clustered index that doesn't fully cover a query, meaning, it, you know, you know, we have, say, three, uh, uh, three values inside that non-clustered index, but your, act, your query is actually looking for one more. It can choose to either go back to the base table using a key lookup operation to get that additional piece of information, or it may just say, you know what, forget it. I'm not even going to bother using this uh, index at all, and I'm just going to do a full table scan. And the range of that decision is defined by what's called the tipping point. And relatively new inside Plan Explorer within the past handful of months is a visualization of that tipping point uh, kind of range. So I'm going to look up at the, uh, inven I believe it's at the inventory table, and then I need to select uh, the VIN number. So let me uh, do a little bit of setup there. There we go. One, two, perfect. Okay, so let me mouse over one of these guys here just to give us the tooltip and I'll give you an explanation. Okay, so we're looking at the VIN number here. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have showed this to you up here. Uh, we're doing a key lookup operation against the inventory table because we're looking for uh, vehicle identification numbers or VIN numbers here. Uh, we have, you know, this seek operation and then we got some joins and then we're doing the, the key lookup uh, correspondingly, okay? That's essentially what's going on here in the execution plan. So why are we doing the seek and key look? Uh, 
uh, key lookup? Well, we're looking in here for a given value, a VIN number, and you see this pink bar here. And this is uh, materialized as the tipping point range. So if we believe we're going to be getting more than uh, anywhere between 7,600 and 10,000 values out of the inventory table, we will tip over and the optimizer will say, forget this. I'm not going to go back to the base table. We're just going to go get, um, uh, we're just going to uh, scan the entire thing. It's going to be cheaper because every single time you do a key lookup operation, that's a lot of extra IO. That's a little bit of extra overhead. Some of you in the audience may be wondering, hey, Andy, didn't you have that cool little blue bar to show us which value uh, was being used? Well, yeah, but there's an interesting different behavior here. And you can see that in the execution plan here. We're doing a whole bunch of index seeks up here. And then we're doing a nested loop joint, meaning that we're not just doing one key lookup, we're doing a, a whole bunch of, or a, not doing one key lookup for 14,000 records. Let me zoom in here so that way you can really see this. Sorry, yeah, I know it's a bit blurry. Uh, uh, so we're not doing a, uh, a key lookup for 14,000 records. We're doing 14,000 individual key lookups. So the, uh, the index analysis is basically showing a summary. It can't show me every single possible key lookup here. And to prove that to you, I'm going to mouse over this guy here, and we will look at uh, you know it's the actual number of rows read and actual executions. Here it is. So. I didn't just execute this key lookup once uh, and hit the inventory table once. I did a whole bunch of different key lookups and that IO adds up ridiculously fast. How much IO you might ask? Remember we got the table IO uh, tab over here. So that shows me against the inventory table, scan count that 14,000 blah, blah, blah. And in some total we did 93,000 logical reads, a whole heck of a lot of extra IO. So this is where I'm going to want to, uh, you know, come back into index analysis, make a modification to this particular uh, non-clustered index. I'm going to remove the other here just for uh, screen purposes. And then I'm going to include the additional columns that this particular query happens to need. I'll script that guy out. And if I want to, I'll go back and rerun the code. But we're not going to do that here. You already saw uh, me working through that example uh, in the prior, uh, prior demo. All right, so with that, I am gonna pause and uh, ask Devin uh, who has rejoined us, uh, whether there are any new questions in the questions tab. Sorry about all that. <laughs> no, worries. Um, no, there are no new questions so far, but if you guys wanna shoot anything over, now is the time. All right. I'm keeping an eye out. That's fine. I'm going to run one more demo and then we'll go back to the questions tab. We are on a little bit okay. of delay. So if you're feverishly typing out right now, we're actually <laughs> not going to hear that because there is about a 90 second delay, despite this being live. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to go over to the command text and I'm going to put in a completely different kind of query. This is a select star from VW all sold inventory. And then I'm going to click on get actual plan. And then I'm going to be showing you the uh, plan diagram here. Oh, one, I got to get rid of that. Select this guy. Here we go. OK. So what you guys are seeing right now is a long running query. And this is something that's long, boring, and it's going to sit here and uh, run for quite a while. But what I happen to have turned on is something called uh, a live query profile, where we will give you a visualization of the data as it's moving around. Um, so this is actually a really cool way to see where your bottlenecks are. So you actually see the numbers ticking up on, off of the different operators as we are continuing execution of this. Um, so uh, yesterday, Force McDaniel did a phenomenal uh, presentation about uh, learning about your execution plans with animations and stuff like that. And this is a different, really cool way to visualize, uh, you know, the the uh, you know exactly what's happening in the course of your execution plans. It's not as good, obviously, for things that run really fast because I'm not going to be able to show you an animation on it. It's already done, right? But if you do happen to have that ridiculously long running query, well try running it in here. See where your blocking operators are. Where are you getting hung up? You know, Do you happen to have a sort in the middle of your execution plan? And for example, maybe that's blocking the, the progress of everything else, right? There's a lot of different permutations about what could be going on. It may not just be these uh, top operators up here. It could be something else down here. And that's also really good for that query where um, it takes literally an hour or two. So you don't necessarily want to wait for the entire thing to run before you start diving in and getting 
getting that execution plan to tune it. Just start running it here and see where your initial bottlenecks are. And that may be more than enough information after maybe two minutes to kind of get a sense of what is it that I need to go deal with. So in this case, uh, even though this is just a select star from what is seemingly a single table, this is actually a, a, a select against a particular view, a nested view, which uh, many of you know is uh, one of my nemesises. So inside Plan Explorer, we do give you a join diagram down here. Now this join diagram is a flattened diagram, but now I can at least see all the different tables that are being referenced in the context of this particular statement. So this is kind of cool. What it doesn't show you are how many times I'm redundantly hitting any one of these given tables because uh, within this nested view, I am hitting tables multiple times over. So to get a better sense of that, I'm actually gonna come back to top operations, resort by object, and then zoom in here. So for example, I see I'm hitting the vehicle make table a couple of times, the vehicle model uh, table a couple of times. I'm hitting the inventory table uh, twice, for example. So like, why am I doing two clustered index scans against the uh, inventory table? I should only need to get that data once. But because this uh, execution plan is pretty terrible, we're actually scanning the entire uh, thing twice over. Um, and I've seen much, much worse here. But hopefully this drives home the point of being able to, again, get into that what's going on here. Am I hitting things in a redundant kind of fashion? Fashion. So uh, make use of a live query profile because, you know, again, this query never finished, but I'm still able to at least deduce this much from, you know, that what minute or two of execution that we did get out of it before we kind of threw up our hands in frustration. All right. Hey, Andy, so, yes. uh, if you do have a second, we have a question and I'm, I'm not sure I might need some clarification on this one. What's the meaning of the lower bound of the typing range? Shouldn't there just be a higher bound? I'm not sure what you mean by that particular question, I, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, by, by typing, typing range. I was wondering if I had missed something. Um, I'm um, not sure. Uh, what tab are we talking about with, um, with the typing range? Feel free to chime in just on the discussion part if you want to keep an eye out on this. Yeah, so we'll re so uh, while you type in the uh, you know the elaboration, I'm going to continue mm -hmm. on with the next uh, demo okay. because again, Great. there's that delay, of course, right? But sure. please yeah. feel free to uh, <laughs> elaborate, um, and uh, we will uh, hopefully attempt to address it. So yeah. the next demo that I want to do is about user-defined functions. Another of my nemesis is, hey, you see a theme here? <laughs> so in either case, I happen to have this uh, select query that's uh, uh, doing some uh, stuff. And I have two user-defined functions, uh, calculate net profit and calculate sales commission. I'm going to get actual plan on this guy right here. <clears throat> and this is going to do some stuff. So now it's done some stuff. Um, and if you're familiar with user-defined functions, you'll know that code is uh, uh, executed on a row by agonizing row basis. And because I can show you the full call stack here, I can now show you that. So you see that I have these different select statements that are run over and over and over again. And I can now show you the true resource utilization uh, um, and the true overhead of each one of these individual executions. Now let's go back to the column chooser here. I'm gonna go back to uh, uh, and pull in object name. And object name is now going to show me, let me zoom in, where each of these different statements came from. So I see that the first two statements came from calc net profit, and then I see calc sales commission was executed, and then I see more repetition here. And this is even further evidence of, you know, the nefariousness of uh, uh, scalar user-defined functions because of the way it gets, you know, repeated row by agonizing row. You may have noticed I only did a select, uh, select top 20 because if I had done more than that, we'd be sitting here for a very, very ridiculously long period of time. Now, there is some nuance when it comes to user-defined functions. Let's go look at the execution plan for one of these guys. Unfortunately, we're not able to give you that actual execution plan because SQL Server runs that code in essentially its own subcontext. That's essentially hidden from us. So we're not able to show you that. In fact, if you tried doing this inside Management Studio and ran it with actual execution plan in Management Studio, you would also have that same behavior. And just like Management Studio, I can at least click on Get Estimated Plan which will run everything in the command text. And now I have the individual executions of the pieces of code. But because I did the estimated plan, I do not have knowledge of what, you know, where these statements came from. 
So unfortunately, that is not uh, uh, exposed in the plan XML. That's information that we pick up when we are actually doing the get actual and you know collecting additional metadata information during execution. But again, because we didn't execute it, we only uh, told the optimizer, get me an estimated plan. Um, that is again, not returned to us because the optimizer doesn't care. The optimizer doesn't, um, doesn't materialize that in the final XML. Okay, so that's a quick bit about scalar user-defined functions. Um, hey, Devin, did uh, that uh, question asker uh, happen to uh, give any uh, uh, additional details? Yes, so in the histogram, uh, when mm. we were going over that, there was a line uh, typing range, um, and it was mentioned in the discussion on key lookup. the line typing range. I mean, there's, you know, there's range high, range row and that sort of thing, but that all, uh, or are you talking about the, the tipping point range? Maybe the tipping point, maybe. Okay, so I mean, the tipping point range is, is something that's calculated uh, within SQL Server. Greg Gonzalez and Kimberly Tripp both have phenomenal blog articles about this particular topic. Um, I think it's in my resources slide, and if it's not, I will go back and add it and then update that resources deck up on GitHub. Um, but I will double check that. But you know, what this tipping point value is and how you calculate it is a completely separate topic in and of itself. So I hope that answers your question. Otherwise, if there are additional questions, I mean, a lot of uh, this is just stats information. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure who's, you know, Aaron Stilato used to be uh, the one person who was really doing a lot of cool uh, presentations around statistics. A lot of this hasn't changed in many, many years. So go back to previous past summits, uh, do a search on Aaron Stilato statistics and go find one of her older sessions. Uh, and that way you'll be able to learn all about stats and how all of this stuff works, the range keys and all that other good stuff. Okay. All right, so uh, just checking on the time, looks like we're doing okay here. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. We've talked a whole heck of a lot about execution plans, but what a lot of folks have no idea about is that you can use Plan Explorer to uh, decipher and dig into something else, deadlocks. So I have a, a piece of code inside and some uh, random code uh, inside Management Studio that will generate an automatic deadlock. Once I've done that, I've used XE to uh, uh, extract the deadlock XML. And then I'm just gonna open up that deadlock uh, or uh, uh, deadlock graph XML here as an XML file. You know, we saved it out to disk, I'm skipping all ahead. Uh, so now I have an XML file that I've just opened up here and I'm gonna expand some of this stuff and then I'll give a, a quick explanation as to what's going on now after I zoom in. Okay. So I have a deadlock here uh, and the, um, you know, there we go. I have a deadlock here and, you know, here's the victim and everything like that. And then when I first open up everything, you know, the first tier of information, this guy and these guys are not SPIDs. They're showing the resources that are in play, the customer table, the inventory table, and the sales history table, right? Uh, that's because a deadlock is really all about fighting over resources. So instead of choosing to present deadlocks from a SPID perspective first, we chose to do it from a resource perspective first. And I think that makes a heck of a lot more sense because sometimes there are SPIDs that are involved that are technically not involved. They're more like the side uh, um, you know, collateral damage, if you will, but they're not the ones that are part of, part of that uh, deadlock in of itself. So when I open up uh, one of these different objects, like the customer table, now we'll see the different SPIDs. We have owners and waiters who owned uh, that resource and who was waiting on that resource. In this case, SPID 60 uh, was owning that resource and the mode and type column will tell you what kind of lock it had. Uh, the abbreviations are all just the standard SQL Server abbreviations. So X is an exclusive lock, for example. Um, and then here's the underlying code that was going on here. And uh, if you look at the other code in the examples, again, all up on my GitHub, you'll see this is kind of contrived code where, uh, you know, I'm taking some different locks and doing some different things to, again, force a deadlock to occur. Now, whoops, uh, apologies about that. One thing that a lot of folks uh, uh, ask me is that why did a certain SPID get killed by, um, you know, killed by SQL Server to resolve the deadlock? Um, this is one of those uh, little bits of trivia that a lot of people don't quite realize. It's defined by two values, deadlock priority, that's what this is, and then the transaction log used. By default, deadlock priority is always going to be zero for a given query. And again, it's one of those things that most people don't realize even exists. Uh, you can uh, adjust this with a query hint, of course. But otherwise, I like to joke that SQL Server is like me. 
lazy. And it will look at how much transaction log a given query has written up until that point. Because you know when you have a deadlock, someone must be killed and rolled back. Well, it's going to pick the statement uh, or the batch that has written the least amount of transaction log because that means that's the least amount of work that SQL Server has to do to roll it back. So if there is a select statement in here, for example, which of course hasn't written anything in the transaction log, boom, that's a deadlock victim. Uh, sorry, you lose. Um, now, of course, you can, if you're looking at all of this, say, you know what, this is a benign statement. I'm going to have the application, you know, rerun it or something like that. So I, in case of future deadlocks, I always want this to be the deadlock victim. That's where then you're going to use a hint or something like that to force the deadlock priority to be like a negative five or some negative arbitrary value. So therefore, again, it'll always be the lower one. So then that, that way SQL Server say, oh, okay, uh, that's, that guy's got the lowest deadlock priority. I'm going to get rid of him first. Now, to help you visualize what's going on with a deadlock, we have the deadlock graphs down here. Let me just kind of resize some of the different elements here. So with this, you know, we can obviously see all of the different SPIDs and other stuff that's at play. But what's also kind of cool about this is that we show the order of operations. That's what these numbers here represent. So, you know, in this case, SPID 59 first took an exclusive lock on the inventory table. And then SPID 58 then took an exclusive lock on the sales history table and so on and so forth. And you can kind of see how the deadlock sort of formed. Or I could be lazy and click on the play button here at the bottom and watch the cool little animation replay this for me. Now, you might think to yourself, why do I care about that? But here's the thing. One thing that I see oftentimes is that deadlocks are due to race conditions, application code doing things in an order or sequence you don't necessarily expect. So you have application code that winds up stepping on each other, right? You know, oh, I only ever expected five users to ever be on the system concurrently. Now we've grown to such a scale that we have 500 users that are using the application all at the same time. Now I'm having con concurrency issues. That's leading to deadlocks, right? So now that I see this, now I can reconstruct the sequence of events, I might make a different choice in my app code to say, you know what, I'm going to put all these different requests into a queue, first in, first out, or something like that, uh, to then mitigate this deadlock behavior, right? So that's why it's important to be able to see the sequence of events, because sometimes, you know, changing up that sequence of events or preventing that sequence of events is key to having that deadlock resolved. All right. Um, so that's typically what I'd like to cover with deadlocks, uh, but hopefully you'll find that insightful and a, a cool way to also leverage Plan Explorer. So with that, I think I'm going to kind of wrap up here, and I, I imagine there's going to be some other different questions. So let's jump back to the slides. So this is a quick recap from earlier, including that reset layout URL. Uh, so I'm not going to cover this. It's just in the deck for your reference. I do want to leave you with some parting thoughts. I want to go back to that quote from Aaron Bertrand. I'm, it's my hope that this presentation, you've been able to kind of see how you can spend more time in Plan Explorer and leverage Plan Explorer as a performance tuning environment rather than bouncing back and forth all the time, right? Um, and up on my GitHub, if you want to recreate any of this or mess around yourself, there is, uh, you'll want to go grab the master PE session file, which has full history of all of the different demos that I run. Uh, the demos, uh, the, the demo notes.txt file, which is my cheat sheet, because um, you'll actually find in there, there's one or two other demos that I did not do in the interest of time, but that you can also recreate yourself. Then, of course, there's also the deadlock graph in there as well that you can go play around with. Uh, so with that, I just want to say thank you very much for joining me. My uh, contact information is at the bottom. Uh, Devin and I uh, have had a lot of fun, and uh, we'll open things back up for questions or random chatter. Yep. I've got uh, questions and comments open. There was a pretty good comment, Andy. I don't know if you know um, details on this. I certainly don't. Uh, there was a comment from Andrew. He says, I wonder how new ADR functionality affects deadlock choices due to transaction log and recovery changes. Ooh, that's a good one. I think mm -hmm. that's a blog. I think that's blog post fodder right there because ADR is one of those things where I've only kind of looked into it from an overview perspective, but I do a lot less admin -y type work these days, but it's still a really, really cool feature in SQL Server 2019. Um, I'm going to experiment with that one. Thank you so much for that one, Andrew. Yep. And also, uh, there have been a lot of comments in here about um, attending some different uh, Aaron Stellato courses, both on Plural Site and on YouTube. Um, I've 
learned so much from her personally um, through SQL skills. I highly suggest anything the woman does. I mean, she's she's brilliant, super easy to learn from. So I definitely can can vouch for for that recommendation. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I I I love Erin to pieces. She is brilliant and phenomenal, and just totally awesome as a teacher. So, very cool. Uh, before we continue on, I am going to ask for one thing. Do me a favor. Give me a quick plus one if this particular presentation met your expectations and or you know whatever. So um, you know because again, it's really my hope that people have learned a bit about Plan Explorer and that sort of thing. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, just give me a quick little plus one uh, you know kind of comment, or if you know if you want to, give me a minus one if you felt that it didn't quite meet expectations or whatever. Please feel free to put it in the discussion. I won't take anything personal, but I do want that little bit of feedback. Uh, um, you know, so, you know, if you, again, just give me a quick sense of that. I would really, really appreciate that. Um, Andy, people are starting to uh, sign off and, and give their thanks and it okay. overwhelmingly positive. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Happy to hear that. Happy to hear that. Well, because of the delay, we'll hang out here for another minute or two, just to make sure nothing else pops on in. And it's always nice. I love seeing all these familiar names. I've seen um, Alan W., uh, which I think is going to be Alan White. We've got Andy Levy here, Tim Cartwright. Um, just so many familiar faces <laughs> and the plus ones are pouring in, by the oh, way. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you all so very much. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you guys got something out of this because I'll be honest, uh, I'll share a little bit of backstory is that, you know, when I first kind of came up with this, I put out a little Twitter poll and a lot of folks were not so keen on the idea because again, it, this could easily be perceived as a vendor session. I'm like, well, you know what? I do want to try and build this as a community session. I'm going to do my best not to be salesy at all or anything like that, you know, yada, yada, yada. So I decided to kind of go out on a limb and say, you know what, if people want to come to this session, they'll show up. Or if organizers think it's a vendor session and they don't accept it, that's their choice. And I'm totally cool with that. So, uh, you know, this is me kind of like sticking my neck out a little bit, taking a little bit of a risk. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are getting things out of this and that, um, you know, again, I have hopefully been be meeting expectations and being able to help you all out for this. So. Hi, Lynn. I saw Lynn McKee. Cool. Hey, I love seeing so many friends. I mean, I, I do miss, uh, you know, these live past summits. I wish I could see you all in the audience right now. <laughs> um, you know, man, I do miss that dearly. But uh, oh, we do have a question that came in from Caesar D. Can you cool. please share your best practices for comparing different execution plans for the same query to help identify what uh, SQL Server Optimizer did differently? So unfortunately, there is not a direct way within Plan Explorer to do a plan by plan comparison. So really, it's all about just kind of jumping back and forth uh, via the history pane. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, if I had, you know, dragged this in via, uh, you know, Management Studio or something like that, or if I happen to have just two separate tabs and two separate kind of history streams, because maybe I pulled the Plan XML out of Query Store from yesterday versus today or something like that. So I'll have two different starting points. But really, it's all about, you know, just kind of bouncing back and forth. But what I would say, though, is my starting point is that I probably would not look at the plan diagram itself. Like I might do the quick trick of the show estimated plans, because again, that's low hanging fruit just to do those quick hits. But I would probably jump down to either top operations and the plan tree, because for me personally, it's a lot easier just to visually do a quick sort, uh, look at the number of operations that occurred, some of the underlying values of the different operations, just to get a quick sense from that high level of, well, what was different? here like oh wait why do I have 10 merge joins in this particular iteration versus only two here or none at all right or something like that so I would kind of like to try and take a look at things from that high level and then I would try and dig into some of the nitty-gritty differences you know I'm a big uh, IO person you know uh, oftentimes, um, I find that, uh, you know, there's a lot of terrible code out there that does a lot of extra IO behind the scenes. So, you know, as Devin pointed out earlier, there's always the, um, you know, co show costs by instead of CPU or uh, CPU and IO, I personally like to switch to uh, cost by IO. I'll, of course, you know, do a quick glance back and forth because maybe I am dealing with a query that is CPU intensive instead. But, you know, typically, again, I like to jump over here. Um, and then the other thing I also like to do is also, you know, just switch up the line widths, by the way, to 
data size. I often don't care about the number of records. I want to know about the volume of data that's being moved around be between these different operators. Because you know, you may have a select statement that only returns one record, but it may have had to, you know, churn through gigs and gigs and gigs of data in order to find that needle in the haystack, right? So I like to use those couple of things. And again, just from that high perspective, where are the key differences? What's popping out to me? And usually once you kind of get used to the interface, you'll find those hot spots and then you can zero in on those hot spots and then, you know, put your execution plan knowledge to the, uh, to the test to dig into the nitty gritty details of why is this thing doing a heck of a lot of work or whatever the case may be. So I hope that answered your question. But it is a great question, though. Yeah. And um, Ed W., so I'm not sure if that's Ed Watson or not. If it is, hello, Ed. Nice to see you. Um, he also addresses Caesar and says, if you set TF8666, um, the statistics used will be included in the plan. You can then check and update the individual statistics. So that is actually Ed Wagner. I actually have the uh, the, the actual oh. stream up here on, on a tablet. And <laughs> it's funny, the moderator view doesn't show last names, but the live stream does. It, you know, it's it's yeah. a wild world out there. Yes, but thank you, Ed, for that uh, uh, for that uh, assist. I, I do appreciate the audience assist here. I mean, that is the one cool thing about doing these things virtually um, is that we have a room full of smart people, help me out. I'm totally okay with that, you know? Uh, so I, I'm thrilled to see that discussion and people uh, tag teaming and, uh, you know, also chiming in uh, uh, and uh, lending a hand. So thank you so much for that. And that's what makes these things a lot of fun, right? Yeah. All right, cool. We'll give this another uh, minute or two just to hang out. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I'm assuming folks have already wandered off uh, to go get their lunches or do whatever it is they're doing. Lunches, dinners, uh, mid-morning snacks, second breakfast. Oh, I'm totally making scrambled eggs and bacon after this. Mm, I haven't decided what lunch is all about. <clears throat> that is a good question. Well, it's kind of funny because uh, my presentation the other day, the beginner's uh, guide to plan, uh, uh, performance tuning, uh, I have a lot of food analogies. So uh, no. myself, Matt Gordon, and a couple of others were like, what are we making for dinner now? Or they were saying, it's like, oh, now I'm craving pasta. Curse you, Andy. <laughs> Another funny, oh silly gosh. stuff. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling right now. Trying to keep it low carb, but then Chase keeps buying my favorite ice cream. So <sighs> next thing you know, I'm neck deep in uh americone dream <laughs> mm, yeah i will fully admit that uh i have not been very good about my eating this week as well or last couple of weeks even so i may have indulged in a few too many cookies and then a little bit of ice cream and uh, uh yeah yeah all right uh any other questions coming in or shall we just wrap things up <clears throat> no i think we should wrap things up no more questions or comments all right. Well, then, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, hanging out with you. Uh, um, so, uh, of course, you have my contact information. Of, and uh, if you ever want to get in touch with Devin, if you want to talk to her rather than me, it's dwilson <laughs> at century1.com. Um, but otherwise, thank you again for spending some time with us. Hope you learned something and hope you have a fabulous uh, rest of your uh, virtual past summit. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.